Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? I'm ready for the event. Mr. Shatner, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. I'm, uh, I'm calling. This is Shatner. Do you hear me? Mr. Shatner, this is uh, the space research vessel ISS in Earth orbit. And yes, I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? This is Chris Hadfield. Chris, I hear you loud and clear. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. I, I'm so moved to uh, be able to speak to you for. I'm so moved to be able to speak to you for for this brief moment. So I want to I want to ask you some questions that uh, uh, have deep uh, have some deep meaning to me. So let me start off right away. Um, you, you're in the International Space Station, but you had to get there in a Russian vehicle. Are we, as America, uh, fallen behind, or is this just a pause on our space program? The uh, space business is an extremely difficult one, and if I think the best way to answer that question is to look at history. You know, we've never had regular access to space. We've had a, a space flight and then a landing and then we review everything and make sure it's safe and then we launch another one. And the shuttle was tremendously vehicle, a successful vehicle flying at 135 times. But it's not like in between flights we could just count on the next one. Every one was really much the, the, the max level of effort that we could do. And so it went from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo to shuttle with many, many lulls in between. And the time it takes to build a new vehicle is quite long. So uh, it, you could say we, we kind of lost our way in between every single launch, but in truth, that, that's not how it works. What it takes is an enormous effort of will and technical know-how to build a spaceship and then to be brave enough to launch one because you risk lives every time you do. And we're just right now in between vehicles, much as we were after Mercury, after Gemini, after Apollo. We're just in the after shuttle era right now. But fortunately, because of international cooperation, we're not grounded. And this place is uh, built by the world and very much put together with the United States as the, uh, as the foreman. And, uh, and fortunately, we didn't have to abandon it as we did Skylab because we didn't have a vehicle or cooperation. Because of cooperation with other countries, people are here living and working. And the United States will build another vehicle, and that will come up here also. Uh, so uh, it's by no means a lost way. Well, it's just I, a natural path. I read that you have already volunteered to go on a Mars mission. Uh, is the, is that have any reality to it? And... And and because of the uh, uh, the nature of this brief time, let me add to that question: uh, You volunteered to go, but isn't that a fearful uh, uh, operation? Isn't that fraught with such uh, make, enormous difficulty uh, and danger? Uh, you've taken a lot of risks in your in your life as well, um, and. It was a risk that, that I decided to take many, many years ago. Really, to accomplish anything worthwhile in life is going to take risk. Um, and even if you decide to stay at home and, and sit at your kitchen table, eventually uh, the ceiling will fall or there'll be a hurricane or a tornado. You can't live a worthwhile life without taking risks. And some things are really worth uh, directing your life towards and putting your life on the line for. Let, let me just say, uh, between the, the real-life exploits of the first astronauts and the, the visually fantasized and, and enlivened ones like you portrayed on Star Trek and so many other people have in, in, in literature, um, they inspire people like me to do things like this. And, and without that inspiration, um, and then without the technological capability that comes along with it, none of it would be possible. And I, I'm in a position to say that uh, the risks are infinitely worthwhile when you look at the, the view that's just out these windows behind me and the things that lie just beyond. And yes, going to Mars is inevitable, uh, just as sailing across the Atlantic or flying across the Atlantic or orbiting around the world or going to the moon. It's just a matter of when we figure out how. We put ourselves together enough. We take those, those visualized dreams and fantasies 
and turn them into reality, which is what we're doing here right now. You are, uh, you have many degrees in mechanical engineering, and you must see the universe in terms of uh, how extraordinary a mechanical uh, engineering feat th that uh, is and how mystifying it is because we know nothing. Uh, do you find yourself uh, in the space station observing as a scientist a part of it, uh, a, 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 a removed from it, or are you able to be to see the unifying parts of it so that you become at one with the universe? Luckily, I think, Bill, the answer is both. Um, mo most people, the highest they ever get is maybe to climb a tall hill or climb a mountain and look around or even get in an airplane and, and start to see what lies beyond the, the normal two dimensions, the, the surface of the world of normal life. Um, to have the opportunity to get as far away as we are here, and not only that, but to go around the world every 90 minutes. and. You never saw it on, on stage while you were filming, um, but the view that they used to put in for us watching Star Trek of how the world looks out of uh, Sulu and Chekhov's windows there, that's how the world looks. It's an enormous, wonderful, rolling earth below us. But all you have to do is flip yourself upside down and suddenly the rest of the universe is right there um, at your feet below you, and that's where the the engineer in me, of course, is, is very much thinking about the ship and, and how we got here and the, and the problems and the difficulties, but the human within me recognizes what we are in between. We've gone from climbing a hill, getting in an airplane, to now actually being right on the cusp of permanently leaving our planet to everything else that exists, and, and I feel uh, hugely connected to that. It, it's what it was inspired in me as a kid, and I've kind of directed my whole life. I became an engineer and a fighter pilot and a test pilot to try and gain the skills to maybe someday do this. And now I'm, I'm doing my absolute best to help people see that, to help us understand where we are uh, kind of philosophically and historically in our increased human understanding of where we do lie in the universe. Right. Hey, those are great big words for, for a, you know, a, a lab technician on a space station. Uh, but, I know. But I, but I definitely get a sense of that all the time. Uh, I, I, it's inspiring to hear. Let me go back to a moment. Uh, you've tested many airplanes. You, you've uh, been a test pilot, which is like the utmost of uh, 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 example of courage in that you're flying something uh, unknown and you don't know what characteristics it's going to have. How do you deal with the fear, which is also applicable to going up into space and, and returning, which is perhaps even more fearful? Um, I read somewhere that uh, you always knew your lines whenever you had a job in the acting profession. I have tried to always know my lines, whether it was as, as a fighter pilot or, or as an astronaut or as a test pilot. And, and the, way I, the way I deal with fear is I try to define what it is that's scaring me. And what I'm scared most of is not knowing what to do next. You know, to be uh, struck dumb on stage or to, to be uh, responsible for a vehicle and not know the right actions to take with my hands or with the spaceship. And so I spent almost my entire adult life making sure that, that I knew my lines, that, that when the Soyuz spaceship, which I helped fly up here, that ev I spent years, of course, learning to speak Russian and then learning to fly that spaceship. And even though it flew itself basically flawlessly up here, no matter what happened, uh, Roman Romanenko and I were ready to jump in and fly it and take over and do it all manually mm -hmm. and fly it home. And that, it, that's a terrifying thing initially, but after years of training where you, you practice everything right down to the nth detail so you know you have the confidence that comes with that, then the fear diminishes. It feels um, like you're on the crest of a wave of ability, and that really diminishes fear. You poised that perfectly as a, an actor uh, who is fearful of the audience, but as long as you practice enough, you, you learn what to expect. The fear comes from uh, something unexpected happening, like forgetting your words or an audience reaction uh, that's unexpected. Uh, 
in my case, uh, your, your face flushes and you get a sheen of uh, flop sweat. In your case, you burn up. It's a little different. Yeah, well, in, in both cases, you go down in flames, <laughs> but one's figurative and, and one is not. Um, <laughs> but I, I, my wife, my wife, uh, Bill, my wife is actually, when people ask her if she's scared of what I do for a living, um, as you say, prior to this, I was, I was a, a test pilot. That was a much more risky profession. I basically lost one good friend a year for the whole time that I was a professional uh, high-performance pilot. And um, so, y yes, this this job has has risk and a level that is fairly high, but uh, there are lots of professions on earth that have a lot of risk. The people, firemen and soldiers, and and some of the professions on earth, and I respect them all for them understanding their job, really applying themselves, and professionally getting their particular uh, piece of work done in the world. But there's another risk involved here as well. You're up there for six months. That's a long time to be away, isn't it? Uh, it is. Um, we have pretty good communications. That, that think of what you and I are doing right now. You know, you think about about uh, the stuff that was portrayed on, on television 40 years ago, of uh, people with a small handheld device standing on the surface of a planet talking to someone effortlessly who is orbiting that planet. That's what you and I are doing right now. And so I can do the same with my friends and family. I can talk to them pretty much every day, and. So it's not that much different than just being on a long business trip. And, and training as an international space station astronaut takes you all around the world for years. So in truth, it's, it's a four or five year period of which five or six months you're, you're in orbit. But uh, with the level of technology we have right now, it removes a lot of the, of the sense of remoteness to it. So, it, so it's, uh, we're busy, happy, hardworking. And we still That's have wonderful to communication hear. with the world. That's wonderful to hear, Chris. I'm getting a little nudging uh, that we're running over time. So many questions about the future of space and, and, and the Mars mission and all. I would look forward to another time to speak to you in, uh, in great depth and find out uh, the, the larger implications of the questions uh, that I was, uh, I've so briefly been able to ask you. You know, th those scenes when you were in Boston Legal were at the end of the show and you sit out sort of on the veranda or the balcony <laughs> and maybe over a, a, a cigar and a whiskey and talk of life. Uh, I, you ought to come to my cottage and sit on a porch. I would love the chance to talk uh, with uh, you about uh, this and, and compare notes. It, Northern this Ontario. is a fabulous experience. Northern Ontario is one of my favorite places. I'll bet you have a cottage up there. Yeah, we have an Ontario cottage, and yeah, you ought to come visit. It's a great place to think about the world and, and watch satellites go over and uh, and really reflect on where I know, we are. I know, the, I know we were short on time. I know the area. It's a pleasure, Chris. I look forward to meeting you in person and uh, sitting down with a whiskey and a cigar. All right, very nice talking with you. Thanks very much, and uh, all the best. Thank you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes your conversation with Mr. Shatner. Please stand by for a voice check from CSA headquarters. Hello. Greetings, Chris. It's Jeremy here with you at, the, at our home, the Kane Space Agency. How do you hear me? Jeremy, I have you loud I'll take and that clear. As a yes. Great to hear your voice. And hello to everybody in, hello to everybody in St. Hubert. Can you hear me okay? We've got you loud and clear, too, Chris. We've got a number of questions here for you. We're going to get started with that, Chris. But before we do that, I just wanted to pass along some words on behalf of the agency. We're, uh, we're so incredibly proud of what you've been doing on behalf of Canada up there, and we're following you along every step of the way. So keep up the great work. And we really enjoyed listening to you this morning. So over to a couple questions. Bonjour, Gilles Couture, enseignant en cinquième année. Euh, vous élèves et moi aimerions savoir comment contrôlez-vous la qualité de l'air à bord de l'ISS? La qualité de l'atmosphère, euh, oui, et pour les élèves aussi. Euh, oui, c'est absolument un problème. Euh, et on manque ici, dans la station, on manque des plantes, des arbres. Et donc, il n'y a pas de système naturel pour ça. Donc, c'est peut-être le même comme dans un sous-marin, un vaisseau sous-marin. 
Euh, nous avons les, les systèmes pour, pour prendre les chimiques de, de l'atmosphère comme le CO2, le CO2 ou, euh, ou euh, le CO aussi, les, 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 euh, les gaz qui ne sont pas bons pour la santé. Il y a des systèmes pour filtrer ça et pour rafraîchir ça. Aussi, on prend de l'oxygène, de, de l'eau et de l'urine ici pour reprendre de l'oxygène pour notre santé. Et euh, chaque vaisseau spatial qui arrive apporte une, une quantité d'oxygène et de nitrogène. Et avec ça, euh, nous avons une atmosphère qui ressemble absolument à l'atmosphère sous Terre et bonne pour la santé, avec euh, aucun problème. Et euh, depuis combien d'années déjà? 11, 12 ans déjà, nous avons gardé la santé bien pour l'équipage ici dans la station et euh, pour les prochaines, pour Jérémy après quelques années en, en, dans l'avenir aussi. Donc, ça marche très bien. Merci. Merci, Chris. On a seulement deux ou trois minutes qui restent. Nos questions. Hi, Chris. This is Ryan Caverly. Uh, my question is, considering the recent success of the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, do you think that the private sector will play a greater role in the development of Canadian space technology? Well, the, the private sector has always played the biggest role in Canadian space technology. Uh, uh, Comdev and uh, SPAR and MDR, MDA and uh, NEPTEC and all those companies, uh, they've always been private sector companies. The real question is who's the customer? And uh, to be able to, of course, sell at Canadian Space Agency and through the government, which is the big uh, purchaser in the United States, too, where we're headed. It, we're sort of like in the railroad days, building the Trans-Canada Railway or building the airports, building the infrastructure so that then businesses can open. We're still in that stage. The biggest customer is still the government. But where SpaceX is headed, where we're all headed, that's where we ought to be going. And uh, eventually, of course, it will pay off for Canadian private sector even more so. But it's a long process. It's not easy to get here. Thank you, Chris. Hi, Chris. I'm Rob from Toronto. Um, you've been doing a great job of connecting with a lot of people worldwide through social media and other means like this event today. What's the number one message that you really want people to take away from your mission in space? Well, the you know, people always ask, what's it like in space? And what's your favorite thing? The favorite thing is looking out the window. And that's not just because it's pretty. It's because it's fundamental to your soul to see the world this way. To be able to just, you know, when I was waiting for this to start, you can't help but go to the window and look and think about where we are. And my fundamental goal is to get people, as best as I can, to be able to see the world that way. To see it as one small place, one bubble of air that keeps us all alive, that we're responsible for, and just how close we are to each other. And uh, it's a perspective that is healthy for us as a species, and it's one that we are very privileged to see, and I'm doing my very best to let everybody see that as clearly as I can. You're doing a great job of it. Thank you. Hey, Chris, it's uh, Katrina from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. We all say hi. Um, Astro YYZ here. Anyway, um, as an amateur astronomer, I'm interested in knowing what astronomical objects can be seen from the ISS, given you have so many lights around you, lights and machines. And is there anywhere dark you can go on station where you can look out and really get dark adapted and see what's out there? Yes, sort of like a little kid leaving home, mo most of our glances are back towards Mother Earth. But we do have windows that face the rest of the universe. And I spent some time looking at, at some uh, actually yesterday, looking at one yesterday, um, and remarking on actually just your question that uh, the sky is almost white with, with the light of the universe, with the uncountable number of stars. But it, it has a lot of variation to it, even just with the naked eye, when we're in the shade of the Earth, so we can really see it. Um, you can see the whole dark sections where, where there's dark matter or, or dust or whatever it is that's between us and the rest of the universe. You can see the gradations of it, like looking into the deepest ocean. And you can see very bright spots. You can't see the constellations because the sky is just so alive with stars. Uh, it turns everyone into an anim 
amateur astronomer to uh, to be able to see the sky this way. I, I, I hope you get a chance someday to come up and just let it fill your head through your eyeballs. It's It's a wonderful sight. Me too. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Um, my name is Jennifer Nichols. I'm an elementary school teacher. And the question I have for you today is um, being in a position that so much uh, attention is focused on you and you, what you have achieved on your career so far, um, what message you would like to give to the people down here or the students down here that can maybe see their dreams but don't have the self-confidence to follow them? Uh, you know, I read somewhere once an interview with uh, Sir Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney of the Beatles, and he said that he feels insecure sometimes. He feels uh, a lack of confidence sometimes. And, and he said to himself, gosh, if I feel that way, everybody must feel that way. And I really took something away from that. I thought if, if one of the Beatles uh, occasionally doesn't feel confident, doesn't have self-confidence, then that's universal. Everybody feels that way. And it's really uh, only with uh, each individual step of accomplishment that you start to build a sense of confidence in your own abilities. When I decided to be an astronaut, I had virtually no skills. I was nine years old. But I thought, hey, I'm only nine. I'm not supposed to have very many skills yet, but I'm going to start working on it. I'm gonna, I want to someday live on a space station. I want to command a spaceship. What, what do I do? How do I get there? And so I just every day started thinking about, well, how do I get there? What do I have to do? Well, I, I need to do well in middle school. I need to do well in high school. I need to understand what's going on. I need to learn to scuba dive. I need to not let my body get fat. I need to decide what I'm going to watch and read and just start turning myself into who I want to be. And with each one of those steps, learning to fly through the air cadets, uh, each one of those little levels of accomplishment, I used to race downhill on, on various teams. With every small success comes a little bit of self-confidence and the things that you can accomplish. So that then when you're faced with a problem that's new to you, you can look at it and go, gosh, I don't know how to do that, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to figure it out. And, and I, I treat everything the same way, whether it's learning to operate a camera like this one, which I, I'm not really all that good at, but I, I've learned well enough to be able to take some very good-looking pictures of the world, or to fly a spaceship, or to, uh, I mean, tomorrow I'm, I'm recording a song with, uh, or playing a song with Ed Robertson and the Bare Naked Ladies. That's a pretty daunting thing, and those guys are scare anybody, but you practice, and you learn, and you prepare, and you think about it, and you visualize, and it's amazing. If you just take one little step of self-improvement at a time, where it can lead you and, and how much confidence it can give you. Thank you. Hi, Chris. My name is Laura Austin from Sarnia, Ontario. And I was wondering if fractures or wounds heal faster in zero gravity. <laughs> Boy, I hope we never find out. Um, you know, it, we're living up here is quite different. It's a very sterile environment. I read somewhere that you're never more, on the surface of the earth, you're never more than 10 feet away from a spider. Um, just if you count the number of spiders around. But I think on space station, we, I don't think I'm, I think the nearest spider is 400 kilometers away. We have lived in a very sterile environment up here. And for whatever reason, it changes our body's physiology, not just bone density and muscle strength, but also our immune system. Our immune system tends to depress a little. And we don't load our bones up as heavily because, as you can see, everything just floats. I don't even have to hold my head up. My head is floating on top of my neck. So uh, we haven't broken a major bone up here. Um, but my guess is they would heal more slowly just because they're not subject to the, all of the regular stressors that help our bodies be tough and strong and that we've evolved to over the last, you know, however many million years. This is almost like trying to recover from something while you're floating in gelatin or maybe in, on, a, on a waterbed. And even though some things may look like they're happening quicker, whether they'll get that toughness and that tenacity and that interwoven strength that we need in order to stay healthy on Earth, I'm not sure. But we work really hard not to have any major wounds or to break our bones. I, I don't want to up here. Thank you. 
Okay, Chris, that's going to be our last question. I think your break is over. It's time for you to get back to work. I know you got a lot to do today. Uh, one big thank you to you from all of us here. We really appreciate it. And really, we only have one other word to describe what you're doing, and that's amazing. All the best to you. We'll talk to you again. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Let me, let me just jump in before people applaud here. Um, let me just say that I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions if there were more, but Jeremy is one of our crew support astronauts. I've known Jeremy, gosh, for over a decade. Um, he's immensely capable and qualified, and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to answer your questions. And thank you very much, Jeremy, for coming all the way up to host today and for taking care of the visitors to the space agency. It's an amazing place, the Canadian Space Agency. It makes this possible. And, uh, and so we take a lot of pride in it and have a good look around today, everybody. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Hi to everybody at the Space Agency, and I need to get back to work. Bye-bye. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, William Shatner and Twitter followers at the Canadian Space Agency. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications. <laughs>